namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa aparuta de sangama tassa tauraye sarvanta So this afternoon, a chance to reflect on Dhamma the way it is. So this is, I like to think like this winter retreat opportunity to really contemplate the way it is, meditate on it's like this, whatever is happening to you, whatever state of mind you happen to be experiencing in the moment, it's like this. And rather than always saying is my my feeling or my emotion, always claiming ownership of what you're feeling in the in the present moment. Because that just reinforces the illusion of a separate self. This is a way of training ourselves to to stop just operating from conditioning, from ego, from cultural conditioning, because that's how we're we're programmed to think in terms of experience is me, I'm experiencing this moment. It's, and then when I first began to contemplate the way it is, I began to um, think, I don't know how it is. How do I describe this moment? And so I start trying to imagine fine feelings or something to say about the way it is. I remember going on retreats where they do this this body sweeping practice. They go Inca type retreats where you go from the crown of the head to the soles of the feet and back up. So, uh, and then you do the full body reflection on the full body experience and and I just at first I just that absolutely baffled me how can I I can imagine I can go to my the top of my head or my right arm left arm go through the thumbs and fingers on the right and left hand go down the chest the back the the buttocks the genitals, the right leg, left leg, toes, and on and on like that. But when it came to reflecting on the whole body, you know, because I I was always looking for an object, and I always considered, you know, the illusion was that I was doing this, uh, this kind of scanning. I was observing the sensations on the top of my head and on down to the soles of the feet. That kind of illusion is me doing it. It's my practice. And then suddenly it, I had this insight, you know, that, that uh, you know, the, the, to have the whole body image you have to let go of everything. There's no, you know, just to try to uh, to see the whole body in one glance, you can't do it. 
where your right hand or left hand is quite obviously easy to be an object to, to notice. So these are conundrums or doubts that arise, you know, how, how, what, is, what does he mean the way it is? Ben Yang Ni Ang in Thai. And the great uh, Thai teacher Buddha Dasa, Chao Kun Buddha Dasa of Suan Mo, years ago, he was always talking about Benyang Ni Eng, the way it is at this moment, not about in, in terms of words or qualities or conditions, but it's a way of opening rather than trying to me trying to see my whole body in some kind of imagined state. Just this empty, open awareness. I began to recognize the, the body is in the awareness, the whole body's in awareness, not in my brain, not as an object uh, of me that I can uh, get a good, make into to a understandable object I can imagine or think I'm doing it. So these are ways of investigating experience because as I've said many times, experience is here and now. So the present moment, now this is what we're experiencing, this moment is like this. And how many of you can say exactly, uh, you know, have the right word equivalent meanings to describe this moment the way it is? But there's a kind of openness in this suggestion kind of, it suddenly stops the thinking mind because you, you can't, the words don't come very easily. You can try to write poetry or, or try to describe it in poetic terms or scientifically or whatever, but that's playing games with, with words again. So this, uh, this, this is very important for, you know, which I keep reminding you during these reflections on the, that uh, the illusion that consciousness is in your body rather than your body's in consciousness. So that's, a, you know, a, an enormous shift Because we're conditioned to think that consciousness is the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, the brain, and all these are what consciousness is about. Sensory consciousness. So the senses are vehicles for consciousness to see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and feel. But senses themselves are very unsatisfactory and impermanent and very delusive. So just to rely on sensual objects, what you see or hear, smell, taste, touch, or think, or feel in the moment, you, you, you know, you can, it, it changes, it's very dependent on other conditions, on the, the weather, the time of day, who you're with, whether you're being praised or criticized, you know, your personal reactions to praise and blame. You 
you know, so he can, this is a time where, where people are very, in modern life, liberal thinking is very open to trying to be politically correct where we don't say things that offend people because we are aware how strong words can be, racist slurs or sexist slurs or uh, whatever, you know, they, we, we think this is uh, not politically correct. So we try to, when we're in public, we try to be political correct, uh, follow the ideals of political correctness. But even being politic, politi politically correct is still not the answer. It's just an intellectual exercise to, that we imagine that we can see the power of words, how they affect us, like being blamed for something or being praised, being ignored, being talked about behind your back, all these are part of a human experience. <laughs> but it's all this sense of me and mine, it's my feelings, my, you don't just say anything to offend me. And uh, when you're talking to me, be polite and respectful because I'm a very senior monk. And uh, according to this tradition, you should respect senior monks and be um, polite and use proper speech, right speech. This is a very good advice. But it's still ideas that we tend to cling to, cling to traditions, to thoughts, to precepts, to what we've been trained to believe is right or wrong, good or bad, true or false. So the way it is, it's not about it's wonderful or it's horrible or I don't know, it's, it's like this. Uh, to me, this, this is like an opening, a wide open space of just being rather than trying to figure out what what the way it is, is in terms uh, and politi politi politically correct terms. Or even in vulgar terms. So reflective awareness Like uh, in daily life, you know, I live quite secluded from the rest of you and have a lot of time all by myself. And the way it is, you know, if it, is it, there's nothing happening, nothing kind of exciting or interesting. <clears throat> Look out at the, of these here these glass doors on my kuti, which I can look out into the garden, look at the barren trees, and I don't know, at the rain falling, the way it is. But by developing this sense of open, wide awareness, it's not critical, it's not complaining about the weather, about being old or disabled, or it's not, it's not a complaining state. It's not kind of say, trying to convince myself that everything is wonderful and I'm very happy, but it's like this, which doesn't need a description because it is the reality of here and now. Now this, this open, wide open emptiness mm -hmm. 
It's silent. It doesn't have it doesn't have eyes, ears, nose, tongue. It doesn't have a brain. It's not about right and wrong anymore, or true or false. It's like this. And you begin to, to just relax and open to life rather than trying to always be busy doing things or distracting yourself or getting caught up with activities chit-chatting, talking to others, using your iPhones, on and on like this are distractions from the way it is. Because wherever you are, whatever the time of day, it's always here and always now. So experience is now. And this wide open awareness, it's being here and now, rather than me trying to be here and now. Now we get the words, so I, you know, I could, I got to practice being here and now. So I, I start from this that I that. Being here and now is something I've got to do rather than just trust in just this wide open, knowing, unknowing. It doesn't know anything. It doesn't need to know. It's rest. It's, it's bliss in itself. Because the the self you is always caught up with becoming something, getting something you don't have, or getting rid of things you have you don't want. Now this doesn't mean that I just sit with an empty mind looking out the window. My goody, I have an iPad, I can surf with my iPad. I enjoy iPads and I find reading difficult because of my vision. But the main practice is the wide open unknowingness of here and now, and just trusting, resting, relaxing, and being the witness to the restless tendencies that we feel through the senses, through the body. And I have been to the shrine on my desk, a little notice that's saying, this wide open unknowingness is what I am, not something I know. So this is a good reminder, this wide open unknowingness is what I am, not something I know. So for us, knowing is defining, labeling, describing, limiting, being beautiful or ugly, right or wrong, good or bad, politi politically correct or wrong speech or vulgar statements. So these are all <clears throat> ways of defining what we've been conditioned to do with our brain, with our intellect, because it's conditioned. Languages are conditioned phenomena. You know, they're not eternal, trustworthy. When we experience, when we try to define reality, 
define this wide open unknowingness with words, you know, we, we, we can't find the words. Because the idea, you know, the self view is, I want to know. What does he mean, this wide open unknowingness? That doesn't sound very tantalizing. Or is it Nibbana? That sounds pretty good. You know, is, is Ajahn Samedo in Nibbana? Or is he enlightened? Or is he just empty? Or is he a zombie? You know, so we we try to to imagine this wide open unknowingness, but it's here and now, and it's just like this, silent, fully conscious. You're not closing your eyes or plugging up your ears or anything. You're not trying to to destroy the senses, but you're no longer believing that sensual experience is one's is the real world that we've been told it is because this is a time in history where it's very very sensually exciting time we can distract ourselves through so many wonderful inventions technology So this this gives us every opportunity to to learn about all kinds of things we wouldn't know about if we didn't have internet. You'd have to spend hours in library or the British Museum to find out about ancient cultures and other languages and and on and on like that to to get all the information. And then we're depending on authorities telling us what what is the trustworthy text to read or what is rubbish. So we're told, you know, this is the right text, it's the understanding of Dhamma, it's a, a true representation of Buddhism, or we might think, somebody else might say, it's just rubbish, it's not true. <clears throat> So then, uh, personally, we might lean towards it's. This is the final text on defining Buddhism, or we might align ourselves with it's all rubbish. But we don't know what is Buddhism. And so that's a question we can ask ourselves, and then we go to the Tripitaka. Uh, we go to the uh, text on the internet, on uh, YouTube, and on and on like that to find out what somebody tells you what Buddhism is. But just the word Buddhism is, is just a sankara and a condition that created by human beings. So it's not dismissing it as rubbish or irrelevant, but it is impermanent. And that impermanence makes it unsatisfactory. Just, you know, to the word Buddha or Dhamma or Sangha are words where wide open awareness, unknowingness here and now, isn't about Buddhism or Dhamma or right or wrong true or false, but it's the reality of being that we oftentimes miss in our daily lives because we're always busy distracting ourselves, looking for something or getting caught up in, in all kinds of political views or modern views, uh, religious views cultural views and on and on like that so that we we can entertain ourselves with, with the far right or the far left or the liberal or the conservative or how we want what we tend to incline toward is very individual 
I used to wonder why everybody didn't think like me. As I, I have a quite a liberal view of life as a person. So being a, brought up in the United States and the West Coast United States, you're, my parents were very liberal and and attitudes towards everything with modern life in in California, very liberal hedonistic experiences of experience life to the fullest, and all kinds of advice like that, like uh, follow your heart wherever it takes you. And and I remember in Berkeley when I was a student there, there was the attitude of the prophet was follow your heart. And that appeals to liberal minds, you know, with, because that sounds very appealing to a liberal-minded, conditioned mind. But then there's a very moralistic line that you, if you don't believe in God and you don't keep the moral precepts, you're going to hell. That is one way of being conditioned, <clears throat> that you're, you're going to, if you commit a crime, or you're uh, adulterous, promiscuous, all things like that are, are wrong, and there's only the right forms of sexual activity, right forms of behavior that exclude drugs, alcohol, sex, and all the rest, where that's very rigid views of this is absolutely right and the other is absolutely wrong. Well, that liberal view is more kind of interesting where the other is very kind of binding to you, to fear. You're brought up in one of these very rigid religious views, then there's a lot to fear. You feel a lot of guilt. You're guilt-ridden and frightened. If you do something wrong, you're going to be punished severely for it. So, fear is uh, is part of our experience through the thinking mind. When you think about the future, just thinking about climate change or the wars in the Middle East or in Ukraine and Russia, you know, or you hear Iran is ready, it might start a third world war, or the United States. And these are very, how do they affect you, you know, in the present moment, emotionally? War is something we don't want. You know, it's a, something Bad is, uh, war is very bad, peace is very good. So then it's about right and wrong. Wars are justified. You know, to go to war you have to justify your reasons for it. And that takes more thinking, more kind of cogitating and proliferating in, in your thinking mind. But wide open unknowingness doesn't think. And it's here and now, and it's when you begin to trust it, Learn to just, learn to relax and open to the here and now's like this. That's what they call bliss. Now the word bliss in Berkeley in 1960 was blissed out on drugs, smoking pot or something, and you get blissed out. So bliss is, bliss in my vocabulary meant something very high. 
you're just out of it. You know, you're blissed out. You're no longer caught in the mundane dreariness of daily life. Or th that's a conditioned view of bliss, to be blissed out, or bliss, or is is that what is bliss ter in terms of reality? Because blissed out is very impermanent. And it and it just and it makes you want more of the drugs and alcohol in order to be stay blissed out. So it's very addictive. But bliss in terms of wide open unknowingness is very peaceful. And intellectually, we want peace in, as a, you know rather than war. We demand that the governments have go have peaceful attitudes rather than warlike ones, and we, we, um, you know, we. There were peace. I was active in two peace movements in Berkeley in 1960, and uh, I wanted peace because there was, in 1960 there was a big threat from Cuba. There was a fear of a, 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 a Russia was arming uh, the Cuban island with m missiles, and there was this incredible conflict going on. And I remember at the university, everybody was really frightened. So we wanted peace. We didn't want war. But peace, wide open unknowingness to the, to the conditioned mind, to the intellect, is not very interesting. It's not exciting. Or war is exciting. Murder is exciting. Sex is exciting. These are exciting conditions. So excitement, you know, the conditioned realm can be very exciting or boring. We can get bored with with uh, the news that you hear on the, the BBC or uh, you can get bored with with too much excitement. So the peace of wide open unknowingness can seem very boring. And boredom is a condition that arises and ceases. And in monastic life, so much of it is boring. Just chanting. Namo tasa bhagavata, where, you know, we got a monotone chanting where we'd like to, where operatic abilities to use your voice from going from a high tone to a low tone. And emotionally, it's, you know, it's rather exciting, emotional music. The daily routine. The schedule, the, the Vinaya precepts, the training rules, the standards of conduct for the monastery. We can learn all these, and they're very right and good and true, but also we can feel very bound by them very, you know, like we're caught in a trap of limitations. And I remember in the first year I was with Lung Pa Cha in Wat Pa Pong. There was, uh, there was so much strict Vinaya being 
forced on me that I just felt incredibly suffocated by all these precepts. And uh, I remember just feeling so bound and and limited and and uh, there was a sense of of a rebelliousness or being critical, thinking it's over the top too much. So I began to, you know, I could see that no one no was asking me to do anything bad. You know, they were all, a lot of the precepts, uh, none of them are asking you to break, uh, to do something wrong, commit a crime, or break the precepts, but it's, it's uh, you know, they are precepts, they're guidelines for living in a community, a sangha, of dharma practitioners. But Lumpachar's reflections on the way it is and being the witness to the way it is, I began to witness my own, my condition, attitude towards precepts, towards limited rules, towards moral precepts, towards being in a situation that I found both inspiring, I found Wat Papong life and Wat Papong inspiring, but also I felt suffocated. And just by opening to that feeling of being suffocated, it's like this, suddenly it vanished. The feeling of suffocation disappeared. Also, I was taking this very personally, the precepts, the instructions from the other monks, the constant reminders, the kind of being constantly reminded how to conduct myself. And, you know, I was a 31, 32 year old man, and, and, uh, I lived a quite an independent life, and suddenly all these younger monks were telling me how to walk, how to carry my yam, how to sit, how to eat my food, how to do everything. And, and then the, the, the pride of a 32-year-old American of liberal conditioning was like this. You know, it was, I tried to buy the party line, you know, about this is right and this is uh, this is the best monastery. I, I was quite willing to go along with that. Because I did admire the lifestyle in Wat Pa Po and An Lung Pa Cha and the monks that I lived with there. So there is a kind of admiration, but also I had to deal with Conditioning, personal conditioning, social, cultural conditioning. And so this is when we talk about Puto as a mantra. Or the witness, taking the witness position of Buddha, knowing Dhamma, then this is, you know, suddenly, you know, you, you realize Witnessing is here and now. I can witness feeling suffocated. I can witness my critical mind, my my resentment about being on being corrected. I could witness the feeling of being bound and caught in a in a trap. So that witness is not personal. It's mindfulness here and now, 
awareness, conscious awareness, it's consciousness, wide open, unknowing consciousness that isn't operating, doesn't need the senses to exist because it is always here and now. It's the deathless reality of Nibbana. So doubt, like the third fetter of the ten fetters of which he ketchum is translated as doubt. Doubt is, is uh, you know, is something to really witness. And before I ordained, or decided to ordain, I was working as an English language teacher in Bangkok, and um, I had a master's degree in Indian cultural, Indian culture. I'd studied Hindi and Berkeley and, and uh, studied Indian history, and I was very interested in the Gandhian movement, Mahatma Gandhi, and in yoga, and in Aurobindo, Sri Aurobindo, and in Ramakrishna, all these Indian saints and philosophers. And so I had a ticket, an air ticket, from Bangkok to Calcutta. I really purchased it. But I was teaching English at Thomasat University, and um, and then I decided, and I was practicing meditation at Wat Ma Thot, one of the main old uh, Bangkok temples by the Grand Palace. So I realized I wanted to ordain, and the doubt came. Maybe I should go to India first, and. Uh, get that over with, and I could always come back to Thailand and ordain. So I had this ticket, airline ticket, and I was staying at the YMCA in Bangkok, and I'd go back to my room after teaching, and I'd anguish about, should I ordain, or should I just go to India first? I could go to India and, and see what that's about, and... Uh, investigate possibilities there before I decide on Thailand. And then I'd anguish in my room at the YMCA. I was anguishing about what should I do? Should I go to India or should I just ordain? Or where should I ordain? And, and I was caught in this. I was lying on my bed in, in an anguished state of not knowing what to do. And then something in her voice came forth and said, shut up and ordain. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> what was that inner voice? I don't know. Is it mine? Is it some uh, guardian angel or deva? But it wasn't through trying to figure out what to do, because that just left me in a state of doubt and anguish, because both our opportunities were appealing, ordaining or going to India. They both had their appeal, you know, and intellectually I was, you know, I was uh, fighting with my intellect about what was right, what, what do I really need? And I uh, could justify going to India, and certainly good reason to go, and then, and then ordaining, and then the inner voice that wasn't from the intellect, wasn't me deciding anything, it just came up, said, shut up and ordain.
So that was, you know, just to share my experiences with doubt, with, with should I do this or should I do that? Should I go to India or should I stay in Thailand? Uh, you know, this, uh, trying to figure out how what you should do in the future, you can be a witness to just by witnessing this, this uh, uh, doubting uncertainty of what to do, what's right, what do I need? personally, for my own growth, my development. Well, at that time, I wasn't really consciously aware of what I really needed. But something about ordaining is something that I had considered seriously for a long time, even before I ever went to Thailand. And so, uh, you know, I like the idea of, of a religious community. And so I, I was really keen on uh, finding, you know, I remember at the University of California libraries, uh, graduate students had their own desks, permanent desks, and mine was on the ninth tier of this incredible library where they had all the books on holy men and Indian teachers and yoga. And I used to look at these books of yogis hanging from trees or covered in ashes, or and I kept thinking, um, maybe I should try something like that. <laughs> Become a naked ascetic in India, cover myself with ashes, or learn to hang from a tree, or stand still. For... And, you know, just the idea of, of asceticism was quite appealing to me. Because I had this kind of romantic image of this life, uh, holy life, as, as being something where you, you gave up everything and uh, you, you really challenged your senses. Where in my life in Berkeley was smoking pot, drinking beer, and, and even though that was quite pleasant, enjoyable, it didn't lead me anywhere. It left me just feeling life is kind of pointless, meaningless. If this is, if this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life, so um, where the holy life seemed very, very romantic and very, you know, what I wanted to do. So then the opportunity to ordain in Thailand. I like Thailand. Thailand's a very friendly, welcoming country, nice and warm. So there are good reasons to stay in Thailand and also good reasons to go and tour India. But then the, this open, wide open unknowingness wasn't a, a conscious decision that I just made suddenly choosing one over the other. It just came from something that I couldn't identify with. So I've never regretted that. In all these years, uh, as a Buddhist monk, I've never regretted ordaining as a Buddhist monk back in 1966. But this wide open unknowingness, or bliss, remember your ego is a conditioned thing. 
the sense of self of me and mine is it's it's you know it's it's very believable because we're programmed to think always in terms of me what i think my view my body my feelings my life and not that that's wrong or even right but it's how we're conditioned So the conditioning is something programmed onto us at, when we're growing up, when we're born, we, we're quite innocent, unconditioned, conscious forms. And we learn to develop, if we're brought up in a very strict evangelical Christian community where there's so much fear and 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 demand on on uh, absolute right and absolute wrong heaven and hell god and the devil then that's conditioning that's the conditioning you get when you're still very innocent unknowing child or then you may be brought up in a in a family where they're smoking pot drinking alcohol and carrying on and and uh, you get no kind of conditioning except survival instincts survive learning to survive in a in a kind of free lifestyle that you're not you know you, because when you're innocent you don't know what to, what to do or where you don't know the limits of behavior So children are always pushing the limits of their parents just to test them out, see how how far to go before they stop, because they don't know. So conditioning is about precepts, and it, we, the precepts for the monastic precepts, the samana precepts are ways of training oneself in terms of action, physical action, and speech. They're not absolute right and wrong, or if you break one of the precepts, you, you go to hell, or you, you, something terrible will happen, or you'll be reborn in a low state. Don't believe any of that. That's just make believe. But they're guidelines that you can use to to limit action and speech in a gentle way, rather than in a harsh, absolute right and wrong punishment, reward and punishment style. So bliss, then, is peace. And it's here and now. It's not something you'll ever get from conditioning as a separate person. Because the personality is conditioned, and, it, and it's a restless form. It's so concerned about what people think of me, or my rights, or my position or my status or you know that you know life for even the most wealthy fortunate human beings is still caught up in in all these social problems because even with all the money in the world it's still you know, the basic problem is ignorance of Dhamma, the open unknowingness here and now, the way it is, which is very simple. But it's not easy because the conditioning is very complicated. You really can't help, you didn't ask for the conditioning you got, you just got what was available. You know, a little baby just 
is open to just like a sponge, it just absorbs whatever comes toward it. So <clears throat> you don't ask for it, you don't choose it, but this is what you get. So in bhavana or meditation, we open ourselves to these conditioning, this, these conditions, good ones or righteous ones or bad ones, wrong ones. We all can have traumas in our life, emotional traumas, misunderstandings. Life is about, it's very traumatic, the experience of, of a person on planet Earth. It's a traumatic experience. But as we open to, to the Dhamma, open annoyingness here and now, we begin to see our real refuge is in the bliss of silence, relaxed awareness, witnessing, not judging, not evaluating, not qualifying, but learning to just trust here and now is like this. And then you begin to see your conditioning arise and go. You know, it just, all your fears will arise and and then if you're patient, you know, then it, fears disappear. They don't stay. Your sense of being abused or misunderstood arises in this kind of meditation because you're conditioned to feel like this, but it, it arises and ceases. And in the cessation is peace. And in the poet Shelley, the funeral of Keats, when the poet, English poet Keats passed away, the uh, poet Shelley, who's a friend of Keats, uh, uh, wrote a very interesting uh, poem called Adonais, and it's, uh, the first stanzas are, Peace, peace, he is not dead, he does not sleep. He has awakened from the dream of life. <coughs> so this is what meditation is, awakening from the dream of life. So I offer this as a reflection. <clears throat>